Councillor McCall, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Harriet? Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, I, I can hear you. I've um, logged back on again. So that's awesome. You say when you're ready. I'm very ready to get started. Let's see the councillors. We have Paul and Ethan online and Gary Tarragon. So, submitted to will go straight to Harriet Chop from a kind of federated farmers who shall be relieved that, that we don't have to use Morse code and we'll just listen to her voice. Thanks, Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, kia ora koutou all. Um, I'm Harriet Jopp and I'm presenting today on behalf of Otago Federated Farmers. Thank you very much for having me and apologies I couldn't be there in person. So Otago Federated Farmers represents the views of 900 members and we ask that our views are weighted appropriately. I will take um, our submission as read but briefly touch on our main points um, before going to questions, unless there's a preference to go straight to questions. No, you touch on the main points would be very good. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So um, there has been a lot, I presume that the ORC have received a lot of feedback about the cost of living crisis but ORC may not be fully aware of the cost of farming crises. Um, so I've set out in my submission um, the recent work of Beef and Lamb and its economic service, and this is focused on sheep and beef farmers. Um, so uh, unfortunately, it doesn't get better for this year. So this is the last two years, and it shows a decrease in profit. And if you look at the detail um, or the majority, so on average, I've used that phrase, on average, sheep and beef farmers in Otago this year will be making a loss. And that is after you consider drawings and interests. And going forward next year, there will be similarly a loss. So our first recommendation is that the ORC recognises that farmers, particularly sheep and beef farmers, are in the midst of a farming crisis. And this is uh, particularly important with rating discussions because um, there is a presumption that the value of your property corresponds with your ability to pay rates, which um, is obviously not the case. So on a more positive note, um, our second point um, seeks a strategic change to provide for rural leadership and engagement with the ORC. So this is really um, working on a lot of the uh, collaboration with the consents team like Joe, um, as well as the policy team uh, in more recent months after the RPS was released on the land and water plan. However, we consider that there could be a strengthening of this um, relationship and as well as um, additional insight to be provided to the policy team within ORC through the creation of a um, rural advisory group. So we have asked what is the allocated amount for iwi within the rural uh, leadership, community leadership, and I think it's around 3.5 million. And our proposal is that some of that could be um, reallocated to also creating a rural leadership group for ORC. I have actually jumped one submission. I'm sorry for those who are reading it alongside my submission. So prior to the creation of a rural advisory group, we also um, proposed that a strategic direction was um, added to the long-term plan. And that says, I will read it out. Um, the knowledge and investment of our rural community over many generations is recognized, including through engaging with the rural community and catchment groups at early stages in policy making processes and allowing the rural community to take the lead on issues that primarily concern them and involving catchment groups to achieve the community's visions, including through partnerships associated with monitoring and implementation. 
So the third point will be no surprise, and that's the um, it addresses a number of the work streams that the central government is doing. And in our submission, uh, we recommend that the OIC lets that provide a tailwind for a lot of the environmental work that is incurring costs that have been allocated through the long-term plan. And there are a number of... Um, um, sub recommendations in that, such as OIC re reconsiders its work program for environmental monitoring and protection until that takes place. So my final um, point that I'll just briefly touch on is how the rating changes may disproportionately impact rural owners. So the first is biosecurity and biodiversity. Um, the OIC is proposing to change the rating mechanism from being funded as a general rate to a regional rate, which is based on capital value. So in short, and I have already um, had the benefit of a number of your time to discuss this, but um, biodiversity and security work is often a cost that is incurred directly by the farmer. And um, we would like to see that recognised. So biodiversity work in particular, so like managing pests is one cost. It has like dual climate change and biodiversity benefits. And um, one of our proposals in there is to allow the rural advisory group to consider how rights remission could be provided um, for those who are incurring those costs directly. So unless there's any other, yeah, I don't, really have any other comments but I would welcome questions or discussion on our submission. Questions councillors? Any online? Yes if I may. Um, Harriet, uh, Harriet thanks for your presentation um, and I've, I've read it through. Um, there's a big emphasis on sheep and beef farmers um, there's also 440 dairy farms in Otago, and uh, just looking at the stats, 273,000 cows. Um, does your does your submission also cover dairy farming? Uh, yes, that's right, Tim. So um, we represent both sheep and beef farmers and dairy farmers and arable and deer. Um, the reason why I've put the sheep and beef economic data at the start is to illustrate the climate that they're under, but we represent all farming systems. Um, any further questions, Andrew? Uh, thanks for your submission, Harriet. I just wanted to ask a question about uh, your fourth bullet point and we you in reference how I see uh, adopting a uniform annual general charge of 30% um, rather than, I think, we're in the early 20s or whatever at the moment. Um, have the feeds done any comparisons with other regional councils throughout New Zealand to give a bit of an idea whether we're out of step or not with the, that current policy? Yeah, absolutely. So there is, we have done a lot of comparisons. The average is um, between 25 and 30%. And we have also done comparisons with differentials on different types of property. So it's not only the uniform annual general charge, but also the utilization of differentials, which I haven't actually touched on in my submission, I don't think. Um, so the differentials are often um, more than one for land such as commercial land or forestry and less than one in some circumstances for rural land, um, say over $3 million. And that is to not only, that's to show that um, the value per person is similar between rural landowners and um, non-rural landowners. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any further questions? Thank you, Harriet. Thanks for your time. Right. Thank you very much. Have you got the mic on? We haven't got a mic so far. We could go to Matt Hollier because Matt's here. And business here as well. Yeah. Oh.
Um, we could go straight to the list of them. Is there, there we go. <laughs> And that's the pages in the middle of your of your books. Um, and may I introduce the Rose, who's the executive advisor from WCG as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your time. Uh, I was reflecting back to my time as the mayor of the Queenstown Lakes District and how hard I argued with ORC to get some interest in where we kind of have come from. Um, I think probably about this time, 10 or 11 years ago, we managed to get a Wilding, Otago Wilding Trust deed, and it was the first time ORC had put their signature on something about wild and conifer kind of control, which was a very great moment. I have another hat on here today, but we wanted to, um, we've submitted an opposition to the choice of option one to roll the wild and control rate into a biodiversity rate for a very simple reason is that a lot of what has been achieved to date in wild and control, both in, um, the Queenstown Lakes and Central Otago has been on the back of a lot of hard work from a lot of people, including funders and including ORC. And we are seriously concerned it would be a retrograde step to lose the visibility that a separate rate for wild and control gives to our issue. And I understand that there's savings and administration and stuff, but I think um, they um, do not outweigh the, the value that is placed on people understanding what they contribute in their rates bill to the solution of a significant issue, which forms the basis of a lot of the work that biodiversity groups do. If we do not win the war on wildings, um, there won't be options for the reforestation trust to plant. There won't be biodiversity because we will have a monoculture, basically. Um, and so while there is an expedient reason for rolling the rates into one single rate, um, we would submit and request that you give that very serious consideration in terms of the benefits that come from having community support and community understanding of what they contribute to the control of this invasive pest. Your own cost benefit study identified it's a 94 to 1 benefit controlling wild and trees across Otago. And um, while it seems a tiny thing, it, the the advantage of everybody feeling like they are part of the solution is significant because so much is achieved by community support. And um, I think your own, as identified in the submission, the research says that people in Otago are willing to pay to support the control program. Um, and we also... Uh, at the end of our submission, in light of Harriet's comment about the land value-based rate, also submitted that for us it's actually something that is the benefit of all of Otago. Um, for the farming community and the landowners, they already contribute 20% to the cost of wilding control on all of their properties. So they are already making a significant contribution to this issue. Um, and that pretty much sums up what we'd like to say. We would, of course, like to encourage you to continue the funding and um, and um, reflect that inflationary precious means with your very... I've forgotten the word I was going to say. Um, <laughs> with your very much appreciated contribution to date, we actually year by year achieve less with those dollars. Not because we're not working hard and getting every single thing out of it we can, but just simply because the costs 
continue to increase, as I'm sure you're all very well aware. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, thanks, Vanessa and Suzanne, for your submission. Um, in terms of the keeping wilding pines front of mind for ratepayers and all concerned, is this just about having um, clear? Um, well, I'm thinking of a rate demand, right? I'm just trying to think of the solution here. Rate demand, biosecurity rate, and, you know, let's take the three biggies, um, wilding pines, wallabies, and rabbits, for example. If that was included in the rate demand, will that help to ease your concerns, you know, in terms of trying to achieve transparency and, and the fact that we are on the case, particularly in these areas, something along those lines? It, it would certainly help. Um, one of our underlying concerns is once you get locked into a larger rate, it's easier for um, future councillors who may not be as supportive as all of you guys are to dilute that further. Whereas a ring fenced rate that is specifically for that purpose protects that funding. Terrific. Yeah, so if the visibility was there in the documentation, yeah. you would feel a little bit more at ease. Yeah. Okay. That's not so the ultimate. Yeah. So it was already visible, visible yeah. on the rate at the moment. So we have a ECG, we'd like to see that stuff say it's the same. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And Kate. So th thank you. Um, just wanted to uh, test out your suggestion that you actually need more. Um, and, you know, I'm looking out the window up there, and I think I'm looking <laughs> some conifers. Um, if you had more, will you have, a, and we've just heard from Federated Farmers and how tight some financial situations are there, would you still have the commitment from the farmers? Uh, could you actually do more and deliver more at the moment? Let's that to suit her, because she interacts with farmers. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have a large deferred program. Mm -hmm. So yes, we could bring on those deferred maintenance um, areas that we've got waiting in the wings. So um, yeah, there's um, other areas um, that are easier to do. That we have such a large list of deferred and some are easier to do than others. So those ones that are easier just keep rolls up, up to the top of the list. And it and I think adding to that is two things. First, the farmers that we are working with are in general very supportive of mm. the pest yeah. control and the support they get to achieve that. Um, but secondly, there's a lot of other landowners, well, a lot. There's QLDC, et cetera, as well, who give us a significant amount of funding, but they are also a landowner. Yeah, as you can see. Yeah. No, it's, it's, you've got excellent support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. We'll we'll now go to uh Matt Hollier from the Upper Lakes Conservation Alliance Working Group, and that's page one forty seven and one fifty one. With a whole delegation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've got um so I'm, I'm Matt Hollier, and I guess I'm, I've been convened what we call a steering committee for our, our steering group, the Upper Lakes Environmental Alliance, and Paula from Manahamuna and Paul from Southern Lakes Sanctuary. A couple of our um, people have been involved in that, as has Michaela Blackrock, who's joined us online. Yes. Um, and I, I guess the, the message I want to give you today, in addition to my short um, submission to the to the long term plan, is that I think the opportunity that has been um, possibly created through thinking at a large scale level and funding for community groups to deliver on large scale work is actually really exciting. Um, the purpose that we can see of an alliance working together is that it can really it can really leverage the, the talents and skills and energy that are already in, that, already in our community and give people hope to keep going, knowing that there's support that can be lasting. Um, you've already heard from a couple of the submissions already that the ongoing challenge of finding funding that lasts more than a year is just never going to end. Um, but um, having having a cornerstone contribution to um, support the activity of groups would be hugely advantageous. Um, 
And one of the reasons it would be really advantageous is that it would um, allow us for the amplification of the efforts of everybody so that they can, at the moment, the, the community groups do not have the time um, or money or, or kind of basic bandwidth to be able to collaborate with each other because it, it complicates things initially, but then creates efficiencies afterwards. Um, and at the moment, everybody's just down trying to do their own earnings, good work, have that in, in their own way. And if there was a way where we could get some coordination um, and support for thinking bigger and acting bigger, then there would be some fantastic outcomes that would be used through both paid staff and, and, and motivating uh, volunteer groups as well. Um, so that's what I'm hoping you'll think about when you're considering this as, a, as part of your plan. Um, there is a number of groups that we're already talking about doing things and how, how to do things that are bigger and better. And we've got these relationships established and we'd love to have the confidence to keep going and do it, do it, do it for longer. So, yeah, that's kind of the, the key message. I want to be yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Happy to take any other questions. Questions? Andrew? I think it's um, Matt and Co. Um, for your submission. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Can you just tell us a little bit about the journey you've been on with regards to the um, strategic direction work and that for the Upper Lakes Ruby environmental alliance? And just clearly, yeah. um, the whole integrated catchment management just seems to be, you know, driving in that yes. direction, which, you know, is what we're sort of obviously thinking, see, well, yes. we're in the, in the phase of trying to get those, um, that approach going yeah. forward. But can you just tell us a little bit about that journey? Um, I, I guess Perth, I sort of came up with the concept of everybody working more closely together and using a collective um, thought process because I come from a marketing and tourism background and I've seen what Destination Queenstown has managed to achieve as a collective marketing approach for 40 years, you know, a central rate pay base that brings through collective thinking. Um, and looking and getting to know through the Job for Nature program, program that I've been working with, with Godlink Sanctuary, Mana Tahuna and the Waiwanaka guys, and kind of look at it and go, hey, there's some efficiencies that could be achieved here. And if people, um, and, and support and, and encouragement, that could really help people go even further. Um, so it's really about thinking, how do you try and bring that together and what's the opportunities? Because um, I, I believe all, all the environmental groups have essentially got their own a united vision. You know, they want to make the place better. You know, and they're all just working on separate missions. And some of the missions overlap a little bit, others are completely different. And so I think there's a chance where if you could bring a bit of unity to just kind of agree on what your, what, what, what your specific mission is in your specific area, and then you go, hey, look, and time to time these other groups can come and help you out. Other times you just keep going on your own. But I think there's a chance to bring a bit of alignment. And that's where I think OIC's leadership thought through the um, integrated cancer with management ideas and those sort of things really would unite people, but it would unite them even better if they knew there was a way, right, actually we can work on this year on year and keep going because you can't do everything all at once all the time, but if you know, right, our program of work will kick in after year three or whatever the story is, then you go, hey, we'll support what the other guys are doing and then ask the fix up what we need to go further down the chain. So, yeah. so I want to try and get a really clear yeah, yeah. Good answer, but um, I think from the OSC's perspective, what what, are, what is your expectation from the alliance perspective yeah. going forward? I think that delivering on that, uh, working with OSC in terms of that cancer management plan, coming up with stuff that's realistic, so that obviously there's, you know, there's farmers involved in community groups, there's, there's overlap between the two, then everyone can sort of agree on what their role is and what their patches are. And if you know you're around for a longer time, it's easier to agree on those, have those conversations. So I think that's a more of a specific answer. Yes, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Good question. There's a to develop an enduring community led network approach so that um yeah, we sustain the momentum and OIC doesn't need to lead everything always. I believe that's a really valid thing. And the Upper Clutha community groups have brought together their own Upper Clutha biodiversity strategy. Um Queensland side of the what to be side of the hill haven't looked at it in quite that way. Um, but the two things are really parallel, you know. You can coordinate people and bring them all together. And OIC doesn't need to be at the front with the lights on, but if it's in the background helping out big time, then we can collaborate and work together. Elliot, we are all right. Gotcha. All right, cool. Um good on, Matt. Um great to hear that. Uh, groups like yourself are seeing this proposal as a um, 
big opportunity. I also note that um, you mentioned direct funding being a, um, I guess, preferred way of, of this fund sort of being being allocated, which is something we're sort of trialling out in West Harbour um, with some site-led um, work. My question was just about the way that that fund is divvied up because we have the option of that being district-wide or at a regional level. And I think you mentioned um, having it as a regional um, rate in your submission. I'm just wondering if you might want to speak more to that and, and why that would be more effective than a district-wide, if that's how you guys feel. I guess I'm a novice in this in this uh, rating system, so I struggled a little bit with the, exactly what, what, what the question was there. But um, I think where you collect at a regional level and people at, the lo at that local region can see direct action can, and make a greater connection, and they knew their money was going towards it, I think from a, you know, the sort of psychology of the human, you like seeing, hey, this is where my money's going to, so it's more visible and more easily understood. And therefore, for the community groups, it's probably more easily able for them to point, communicate back to the contributors and go, hey, thanks very much, you've contributed say, 40 cents in the dollar to what we've been able to achieve here and hope you're, hope you're feeling like you've got good value for your rates. That might be it's a, a sense that I've got, um, how practical it is from a rating collection at all. I'm not, not aware. So if there was the option to collect that mm. at a whole of Otago level versus at a district-wide level, you'd prefer that to be district-wide, is that? I, I guess the other the, the other concept is we're aware that you know we're in the headwaters of a catchment, so we do also appreciate that the, all the work that's done up here has a literal flow on effect um, further down into the into the uh, wider region. So um, yeah, I can see both sides of the argument, and I don't really don't would, yeah. wouldn't know how to put it in yeah. and say good luck making these decisions. Yeah. But, um, Brian, you had a question. Yeah, Paul, I, I'm just. Um... I like the concept that you're promoting. Um, as a matter of interest, uh, what's the alliance currently working on? What, what, what successes has the alliance had, per se, as opposed to the separate stakeholders, the sanctuary, why Wanaka, Alina? Look, as, as an alliance, the, the success we've had is the two pages we've put in front of you. <laughs> um, but also, we've We've had, had a chance to get to know each other really well and talk about the different challenges and the opportunities that come from being um, as oh, you were under yeah. an alliance. Previously, if there was no concept of that, you wouldn't you just sit in your own office or in your own truck or on your own paddock. You'd never even talk yeah, about so it. Within the, yeah. yeah, so and um, Manatahuna and Southern Lake Sanctuary looked at um, um, joint proposals for, for funding to create some work happening together. And we do have some informal arrangements um, with others where we just, you know, sort of boots on the ground and might go and help out other pokes and that sort of stuff. But until you've got that certainty of where you're going and what that you can do it for a number of years, we haven't done anything that sort of is set the strategy and then come through with the tactics afterwards. Cool. Thank you. And Matt, just one question on so, so just checking on both the key points. So you've got uh, uh, leverage uh, with the power of the community, uh, unified groups to gain strength and momentum, and then you're only going to carry enough resources to make sure you perform your agreed functions, but one of the key things I see that you're seeking, just check them out, you're actually talking more, not just so much funding, but long-term sustainable funding. Correct. Uh, Paul spoke to it with his Southern Lake Sanctuary side of things. The, um, the work's never completed. No. Um, and um, being able to expand and go into other, other areas doesn't mean you can neglect the stuff you've already done the work on. You know, for, you know, um, late pay is the work that Manatanun has done at that area. You know, they've done some incredible work there, but in five years, ten, ten years' time, you've still got to keep on top of it. You know, um, and you, you'd love to move those project people on to you know other water area, um, specific waterways or other areas because they've developed the skills. But how do you keep on top of the stuff you've already done? Yeah. And you can only it, it's um. We have found in terms of promoting specific projects a bit more sexy to go, well, there's new stuff going over here and people jump on that and go, that, that's really cool. But there's that stuff behind you don't want to let go. Yep. Excellent. Perfect. So questions, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate your time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And thanks for the work you're doing. Pages. Now we'll have uh, Mr. Murray. Pages for Murray. Pages is eight and nine.
Okay. So online, uh, we should have uh, Mr. Phil Murray from the Central Widen Group. Phil. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Got you well. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, just a, a very quick, a brief background on who we are. Uh, Central Tago Widen Pine Control Group, so community group set up. Uh, we we came out of a, a meeting, public meeting, uh, people concerned about wilding pines in 2012, and we were incorporated in 2014, and we made of a bunch of community people um, concerned about the effect of wilding pines from farmers concerned about its effect on, on water and irrigation water through to people in town concerned about wildings and the effect on landscape, seeing wilding pines move up over the hills uh, behind the Alexandra, behind the clock there. Um, and we started a program, established a strategy back uh, in 2014 and gathered up money and started a program before there was any national program. Uh, and we had a program going um, by the time the national program got underway. Uh, in 2016. So the national program uh, was grafted onto our program. So we we implemented the uh, the national program as part of our our program, which is uh, continues to be to be the case. Um, so wilding pines are probably the biggest biosecurity threat in in the Targa. Um, and we, we, our, our vision is that we assist landowners to control uh, wildings on their property to, to a point they can reasonably expect it to control them themselves. So we, we don't carry a stick. We just assist landowners who believe that they are a problem on their farms to actually control their trees. And if they don't believe that they're a problem, then uh, we can't do anything and don't do anything. Um, so it's very much, we're very much in the hearts and minds game, convincing landowners that they, if they don't deal with them now and they don't believe they're a problem in the future, they soon will. So we've made great inroads in the hearts and minds game of convincing landowners they're a problem. And uh, we, we, we were making, we have made huge, huge progress. So we've got wilding pines down off uh, the big landscapes, um, you know, the Dunson Mountains, uh, the Hawktons, uh, Kakanui's. Uh, we still got some work to do on the northern pieces. So we're getting them down off these big landscapes and we are, we're down to the hard yards, the, the seed sources. Uh, and those seed sources are, are forest plantations, towns, uh, and shel shelter belts. So that's that's where we're at. So we were assisted by the national funding, and we had one lot of sixteen million for two years, and then another lot of a hundred million for four years. So we've come off funding of an average of about twenty five uh, million there. This is nationally. Uh, over the whole country. So we were able to make some real big inroads into uh, controlling wildings in Central, but we aren't there yet. So what's happened is that central government funding has fallen off a cliff. We've gone from an average of about 25 million a year down to uh, 10, 10 million, which ends up uh, at 8 million uh, for controlling trees after MPI have taken their, their cut. So we aren't going to be able to hold our own with uh, with the control work we've done. We're going to be losing ground. So the the first point, and there's only two points that really I want to make to the long-term plan. The first point is that um, we, we believe that the funding is going to be inadequate that you are projecting for uh, for biosecurity, because the way you budget it, um, wine and pines are part of your biosecurity budget. We believe that that funding is going to be seriously uh, inadequate and because regional councils are going to need to step into the void as you are with uh, a number of environmental issues, 
that the government has stepped out of. And the implications of not stepping it in, into that space in the wild and pine area is very serious. And we will point to uh, areas like those forests uh, up above uh, Roxburgh, the Onslow forests, where we predicted some years ago, and it's been borne out, that those are starting to reach coning age uh, and we're getting serious spread off those forests. And that's just an example of, 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 of one. And it will only take a really big northwest, and those forests will spread into the head of the Tairi and over to Papua Nui Conservation Area. And that has huge implications for both water and nature conservation. And the cost of controlling those is going to be significant. And we haven't got a legal framework at the moment to sheet that cost back to the exacerbator. So there's some huge costs on the horizon and we're going to be losing ground over the whole of Otago with the level of budget we, we've we got. So we're going to be down to about uh, something like 170,000 um, funding this year from under the national program. Uh, and question, question here for you, Bill. Yeah. It's a question built good, uh, okay. So uh, the ones that they can't slow, um, are you talking about the actual forestry block or the trees that are no longer a forestry block, but are just, and we, have you reached out and discussed a way forward with that landowner or landowners? Okay, um, the, 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 project, the project manager, uh, Peter Oswald has been in, in touch with those, uh, with, we're, we're actually the Forest Owners Association, and um, and there's a he's trying to establish a a protocol there where the Forest Owners Association will step in and um, get those foresters to do something about it. We haven't seen any evidence of that uh, so far. Um, there's been some. Uh, we understand there's been some discussion between the landowners there and uh, the forest owners, but there's a, there's a huge amount of work to be done in there and we don't see any evidence of it yet. And we've got, you know, probably a few hundred thousand dollars worth of immediate control there that needs to be done along the edge. But we, it's a high, it's a high trust model that, that you're talking about there, Kate. So um, we, we're working on it, but there's no compulsion there. Uh, I appreciate the compulsion. I just asked, have you talked to the people? Yes, yes. It doesn't yes. Really yes. 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 Yeah, thanks. Look, the proposal here also um, is suggesting moving from the current um, uniform charge to as part of the Biosecurity Act being land value charge. Do you have any comment on what's the most appropriate basis for the rating, uniform or land value or in fact capital value? Um, we we would support support it on the basis of uh, of land value a land value charge. We are we're quite strongly opposed to it being lumped in with the uh, general biosecurity uh, rating. We would like to see um, a combination of general rate and land value rating. Um, and we would like to maintain the specific um, Wilding rating for wilding pine control, because that that has a huge um, part to play in reminding people when they get their rating bill that wilding pines are a specific standout biosecurity threat in itself, and is not just another biosecurity threat. Uh, it's a standout, so we would like to see that specific rating. We would like to see it part part of the general rate and the combination of that with the land value rate. Uh, one last week question I put at you, Elliot. Just time is on my not on my side, but Elliot. All right, be very quick. Um, just wondering how you feel about the proposal for a large scale environmental um, funds, and if you see any opportunity there for welding control through that proposal. Sorry, sorry, Elliot. What was that again? That first part. Um, so we've got a proposal in the LTP for. A New large scale environmental fund. Yes, um, yes, you see that. And yep. I'm just wondering, yeah, if you see any opportunities in there for wilding control 
um, modern crime control. Sure, sure. Um, well, it's pretty it's pretty difficult to use because I think if you look in the small print of it, um, it it's not open to individuals. It's only open to kind of community groups. So it's actually in practice, it's actually quite hard to fit circumstances where you might use it. Um, it's good for community groups around towns, um, like mm. um, around uh, Cromwell. That's that's mm. really really good. It's really good for around towns, uh, like on the half mile and things like that. But it's actually pretty difficult for individuals to uh, to use it. One last question, Bill from Council Noon, Andrew Noon. Bill, the question about, I think it's an operational matter and, and Richard's online anyway, but you know, you talk about that um, post doc um, arrangement with the ORC. There seems to be an existing delegation that hasn't got the flexibility going forward. Are you just able to expand on that? And hopefully Richard will be um, picking um, up on this as well. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that's a bit of a key, uh, been a bit of a key problem. So our our co piper if you like, um, well, one of, one of our key, key determinants about whether we're successful is hearts and minds. One of the key components of hearts and minds with farmers is that we are able to be really efficient and really flexible about how we carry out that, that work um, that, that is specifically designed for the farmer on that farm. So we need a high level of flexibility, and we and to do that we need to provide our project manager with a high level of independence. So he's got a a goal that he's got, and we allow him a high level of flexibility to get that ball over the goalpost. You just go and do it, okay? When that when that model that copapa runs up against re, uh, regional council, highly bureaucratic, inflexible system, there's real problems. So we we are having trouble, it's a bit of a block, to actually give our project manager sufficient independence that he can carry out statements of work or produce statements of work for the, the, the contractor without getting ORC approval for those statements of work. And we've never had this before. Our project manager has always been able to uh, issue statements of work to the contractors and get it done. This new step of, of having um, to get ORC approval for every statement of work will just be non-viable. We'll might as well go out of business and pick our bags. And, and ORC might as well take it over. Thank you, Phil. Much appreciate it. Yep, cool. Hey, you guys. Good. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Bye. Kylie, we still got Sarah online. Sarah's dropped off. She's dropped off. We will go to yeah. the next submitter that is in the chamber. Oh. You're, you're, you're in his seat. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, I've been told I'm submitting, but. Oh, now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was later on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I was at 12D, but now. Okay. Yeah, we're bringing, we're bringing forward. Uh, right. QRLC. Yeah, no, let's just start checking it. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Tika. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon all. Okay. Uh, obviously, we all know Queenstown Lakes District has been the fastest growing area in New Zealand since at least 1996. Now, in our district's population grew by an astounding 8% in the last year alone. For perspective, the country's fastest growing city is Hamilton, which grew by only 3.4%. This compares to Otago, of a growth rate of 2.7 per uh, percent. Uh, given the extreme levels of growth we do see in this district, bespoke solutions are needed to address the issues facing our district. One size fits all does not apply here. The high levels of growth in tourism in Queen, uh, Queen, 
Queenstown Lakes District means we must ensure the transport network is fit for purpose, the environment and the landscape are protected and enhanced, the district has appropriate emergency preparedness and natural hazard resilience, and I'll address each of these three areas in relation to the proposals in the draft LTP. Before I do that, collaboration between QLBC and ORCs. RRC and QLBC are already collaborating on these issues through our Grow Well Fiora partnership and the 30-year spatial plan. This partnership was one of New Zealand's first urban growth partnerships and is an excellent tool for building relationships, fostering alignment and securing long-term direction that we need to continue to use as a framework to achieve success. QLBC and ORC need to continue to work together within the Grow Well Fiora partnership to ensure that the sustained and rapid growth in the district is reflected in our infrastructure growth planning. For example, if our plans or business cases underestimate the growth occurring, investment in public transport will not be agile enough to keep up with the growth. Transport. The provision of effective public transport continues to be a vital issue for the Queenstown Lakes District and the ORC. Growth in the Queenstown Lakes District has outpaced the ability of the transport network to cope. Our work together in the Grow Well Fire Partnership has shown uh, Queenstown Lakes District requires a 40% mode shift on State Highway 6A by 2028, which will require significant increase in funding for public transport. This is essential for accommodating expected population growth managing congestion, noting that we've got a four-year BP roundabout uh, construction happening, and the rapid de decarbonisation required by our regenerative tourism plan. There is a strong community demand for public transport in both the Whakatipu and the Upper Klupa that is highlighted in the QLBC LTP, Spatial Plan, Climate and Biodiversity Plan, Regenerative Tourism Plan, and QLBC's annual and long-term plan processes. We are concerned that recent gains in public transport patronage in the district are losing ground and the service is losing credibility. Levels of service need to be improved to make the meaningful steps towards our joint transport goals. This means moving beyond demand-led public transport to an approach that drives behaviour change through the provision of effective customer-centric public transport. Therefore, we would recommend a significant investment over and above the proposed actions to achieve the necessary mode shift in the district. Upper Klupa transport proposals. Both Council and the Wanaka Upper Klupa Community Board oppose the lack of public transport for the Upper Klupa in the draft LTP. There is a strong case for the provision of public transport in the Upper Klupa, as demonstrated by the success of the recent QLDC funded trials, and because Upper Klupa is expected to grow a continued growing at a faster rate than the Whakatipu, as it has been as it has done over the past 10 years. I reiterate the point made above that we need to drive behaviour change rather than being demand-led. Further, the need for sub-regional approach is recognised in the spatial plan that we are both partners to. Transport rates. We oppose the proposed targeted rate portion of transport rates being out on a district-wide basis. Applying this to areas that do not benefit from having a public transport service is contrary to ORC's approach for targeted rates to be applied in the area of benefit. The rates impact for Upper Klupa residents would be would equate to approximately $124 and $247 per household for a service that one would need to travel to Queenstown to, or further to, to, to derive any benefit from. The small benefit that residents outside of Queenstown get from existing public transport services are covered in the general Otago-wide portion of transport rates funding. We strongly recommend that the targeted rate to, to be applied for Wanaka, Glenorchy, Kingston, Albertown, Harwell and Luggett be only applied when public transport becomes available in these areas. On rates more generally, we're concerned that using capital values to determine rates means that uh, Queenstown Lakes District property owners will contribute a far greater share of ORC's rate and revenue, which is not necessarily reflected in the services provided within the district. A more equitable method for determining rates for the Queenstown Lakes District should be considered. In the environment, Queenstown Lakes District Council strongly supports the new environmental fund to fill the gap left by central government. Investment in the environment is critical 
and of itself and for the wider benefits. Our landscapes, wilderness and reputation as an environment, environmental steward support our tourism and GDP growth that on, on average outperforms the rest of Aotearoa New Zealand. Queenstown Lakes District's environmental community group, groups contribute significant time, effort and biodiversity gains. The track record of success deserves a right-sized, high-trust funding model. QLDC supports as much additional funding as possible, including seeking further investment from third parties over and above the rates funding. At a local level, QLDC supports, strongly supports ORC's role in Lake Hayes by Whakakata restoration project and encourage the funding for this project to continue. Wilding ponds, we oppose discontinuing the wilding tree rate and using the biosecurity rate to fund support for wilding conflict control groups. This will compromise gains made in future progress. Including wilding control activities and the biosecurity rate will likely reduce wilding pine control and this, if this fund is contestable. It is important that ORC acknowledge its contribution to this important work. Hazard management. Increasing frequency and intensity of storm events means bigger impacts on people, property and communities. QLDC appreciates its working relationship with RRC at the head of the lake, Brewery Creek and Reavers Lane. We support continuing to collaborate on the critical work of flood protection, drainage, river management and other hazard management activities. So, in closing, QLDC looks forward to continuing to work with the RRC through the Grow Well Fiora Partnership on these issues. I got through that all right. I think that was a good question. Okay. Uh, I'm interested in transport one, and while your actual submission says uh, put the upper lakes, uh, upper Puka, into the next long term plan, I think you're, you're actually suggesting we should be driving some or trying to place some buses there sooner based on your trial. Look, the sooner the better. Um, Councillor, uh, the appetite for public transport in the upper cliff is um, I think in the feedback we've had regarding the trial that we ran over the last couple of years, um, the feedback I've received from the RRC is that it didn't go as well as they'd hoped for. But as I mentioned before, this should not be a demand-led service. This is about behaviour change and actually driving um, the urban environment we need into the future, given the growth we do have. Yeah. Question. Uh, two questions. Yeah, the first one is on that um, point of driving behaviour change by being proactive, um, and totally appreciate that. Um, yeah, we've, we've been working together um, really well, and thank you for um, yeah all you've done in that space, and that um, yeah what PT sits with the ORC, so we can answer our own question on what um, shifting to driving behaviour change uh, might mean, rather than you know, taking that proactive approach. But do you have any ideas about what um, being more um, proactive? Uh, being less demand lead might look like. In Queenstown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, your, in, in the district. Yeah. Okay, so for Harwea to Wanaka, that's probably one of the main routes. Yeah. Um, that is a large growth node. I think if you look at our spatial plan and some of the plan changes that have happened since, I think there's another one, two to 3,000 dwelling units just in that area alone. Yeah. Harwea will be the size of Wanaka that Wanaka is now. Mm -hmm. When you look at our southern corridor and our eastern corridor here in Queenstown, it's, it means up, upping the frequency and the reliability. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that level of service is actually meeting the community's needs. And just, if you've ever read a book regarding how men design the world in an engineering perspective, if buses don't actually run outside of our normal commute hours to and from work, we're actually missing out on 42% of the economy. Yeah. And that's your mums running, your mums and dads running kids to and from different events. Yeah. There's a there's a hidden economy there that doesn't actually get uh, looked after when it comes to PT in the current form. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll just go on the way. Uh, Councillor Weir, then Councillor Kelleher. 
Thank you. Kia ora, Glenn. Um, totally to talk of those comments around not just meeting the demand that's already there, but but going above and beyond to to induce more and keen to actually um get on and do that do that and noting your or CLDC's opposition to charging that targeted transport rate on a district um wide basis. I'm just wondering if you guys have any thoughts on um the proposed switch from that targeted rate being um capital value to a uniform charge. Okay, so I agree with my statement that the targeted rate shouldn't apply to people that can't actually access the service or have to travel to access the service. Uh, with regards to capital value or a uniform general rate, I would rather it see I'd rather see the targeted rate based on capital value. Um, what you we have if the proposal with the uniform general rate means that an entity such as a hotel will be paying the same as a normal resident, and the demand yeah. and the cost application. Uh, cost creation from a hotel is completely different to um, a resident, residential dwelling. Thank you, Glenn. Gary. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Um, so just on that then, you've proposed that uh, the Upper Clutha and and um, well, all of QLDC really uh, are sitting in a less equitable position because of higher capital values. So two questions. One would be, um, what would you see as an alternative um, way of fairly rating that would then be fair across all of Otago. Um, second question that was around the um, you had indicated that you felt that for a higher capital or well, higher rating value or rating payment made uh, that Wakatip didn't quite receive the services that other areas received. So which services are you feeling you are sort of lacking in? Okay, thanks, Councillor. So, if I remember my stats correctly, the capital value of our district is sitting around the 60 billion mark, and I think that's pretty similar to all of the Eden City. So, general rate wise, based on capital value, the total sum is the same. Now, when I see the level of service and the actual worker base of the ORC and where it's based and where the growth is actually going to occur in the future, um, I see a rather disproportionate allocation of resources. Um, as to specific details on the level of service that we would expect to see, I think that's probably more of a perception problem that the ORC has with regards to being this far inland Otago. Look, you're not as well seen as you otherwise would be, let's say, in the uh, eastern coast of Otago. Now, that's probably something for the political body to find at the RRC to figure out, not for me. Thank you. Councillor Scott and Councillor Lude. Yeah, um, so, no, okay. On the North Key, the ORC, QLDC, there's, there's been a lot of work there over uh, a lot of time. It's in a really hazardous area. Just any brief comment in terms of your vision for the North Key? So, if you refer to the spatial plan, it is not identified as a growth name. It is pretty much, the North Key will pretty much stay as what the North Key is at the moment, with very minimal growth. Um, Glenorchy itself, look, I'm chair of Lifelines Otago as well, and the post earthquake planning, um, Glenorchy is going to have to be pretty self reliant for quite some time post uh, AF8. Uh, so for us, Glenorchy, we will invest to keep the level of service that it has now, but further growth and further expansion of Glenorchy would be very hard for us to agree to. I'm going, yeah. I'm going to go to Council Meffin because I've missed them online and you yeah. can have a chat once we finish, Andrew, if that's okay. Unless, Thank you. Yeah, just... Okay, tell them. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. I was feeling like a bit of a ghost sitting here, actually. But um, no, that's good. Um, but, um, there's been a few comments made already about the rating um, system um, and, and capital value. I mean, these must be issues that 
uh, QLDC are also facing um, as well in terms of um, the high value of properties in Queenstown. Um, and also you will have quite a few absentee landowners too. Um, how's, how's your council actually looking at the rating system? And if you've got any suggestions for us. The, you still receive your rates whether you live here or not, yeah. and you still have to pay. And I say it with a smile on my face. Um, look, it's a constant dialogue we have around the political table at QLDC. It's a matter of do we have the differentials right between commercial accommodation and uh, residential and um, the rural land holdings? Look, we try to target the costs created by, driven by the demand in this town, but the main probably cost driver that we probably, that I can tell you now that we don't actually collect the sufficient funds from is the tourism sector and the visitor economy. And that's probably why this council has been pushing for a uh, visitor levy bed tax for quite some time. Um, our own internal uh, work has suggested that 30% of our rates that we pay at the moment supports the visitor economy. So apart from changing differentials, as okay. well, yeah, the, 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 yep. the rating system is a bit of a straitjacket when it comes to council funding, and you're in the same boat we're in as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I was sort of wondering if, if we were to move away from capital value, what we'd what we would move to 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 sort of accommodate you. Oh, look, there's been discussion around the table. Sorry, yeah, there's been discussion around the table moving back to land value, um, but again, that probably targets more vacant land, and there's an appeal to that because it means it stops land banking, but. We're comfortable where we're at. We're, we're trying to rate where the costs lie. I think if that's your main principle in um, determining your rates, I think you're on a more of a stable footing than if you start going down other ways. Yeah, yeah. It has to be in this space. So, yeah. Andrew, I'm going to allow you a quick but I'll just before we start, we'll have this one question. We've got, um, we've got submitters at one, uh, at one o'clock that will be here to go. Uh, I suggest that we take both those submitters mm. because they'll be here and then we'll have a lunch break. But I'd like you to have five minutes just to have a wee breather. So, thank you, Mayor Lewis. Thanks, Glenn, for your submission on behalf of the Council. My question was just around uh, Grow Well by Aura Partnership because I think, I think what you're asking us is to ensure that every strategic document that we develop that we emphasise the importance of that partnership in some way, shape, or form. In other words, have some visibility around the importance and of, of that. Is it? We yeah, so that's pretty much the basis of where we want to head for the next 30 years. We're yeah. in the process of um, going to version two. So once we get the LTP out of the way, uh, that, that work will probably be accelerated. What we're saying is now that the ORC are legislatively required to be part of this group. Um, my expectation, I think it's council's expectation that uh, that you actually do come along with that journey um, and actually do be involved quite heavily because the growth factors here are too large for just one entity to take it on by itself. Thank you. Thanks, so. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much for readjusting your schedule. No problem, uh, council. All good. And we'll just take a five minute break and we'll be back at one o'clock to hear our next contingent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If, I, if I could just say, we had uh, one submitter that through uh, technical issues were dropped off, uh, which is uh, submitter 240 and 253, the Tikkahano Terra Trust, uh, Mike Cobra. So I'm pleased if you could make sure you've uh, re-examined that, that, that submission, 94 and 96 of the pages. And if there's any questions from that, we'll get that to Mike uh, just as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. So we've still only got another two today. That's it, yep, yep. Yeah, that's what we're gonna have lunch after. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much.
Excellent. Uh, so if someone, if you could come forward, it would be great. Thank you. And your team. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Different things yeah. um, Thanks for having me today. Um, Sean Kelly is my name. I'm, I'm an owner director of Tora Jet Services, um, KJ. Um, oh, yeah. I'll just give you these um, drawings and sketches. Actually, a look through. Thank you. As we all know, the traffic volume in Queensland is very uh, congested now. We're looking for alternative alternative routes. Um, KG has a resource consent for um, six ferries from Lake Hayes Estate, which is down the Kawara River um, and into Queenstown Bay. And pick it, pick it, pick it, different areas there, and some of them will be um, uh, jetties that are going to be put there eventually. <clears throat> Uh, these boats are 40, 42 seater boats, um, uh, catamarans. So it makes them quite comfortable in the rough. Um, uh, that was like what we did, it's very rough. But the concept is there to have a, uh, a fully enclosed air conditioned, air conditioned units. Um, Oh, yeah. The um on the on the plans I've given you there is the concept plans of of the the main down pier for the ferry ferry on the end of it. Um and then the um the jetty structure at the terminal down at the down the Lake Hayes um that will have gone up as well and the access under the core for the stand, you know, the consultation process not long ago said to us that the speedboat wasn't an option for transport on, on a lake from the core and um, lake well, typically, but they, they didn't do the homework properly. They, they haven't even investigated us. On what 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 capacity boats were in them that we would propose and um, with that they said it's, it was an important they weren't really interested. This is the proposal um, that we went to public consultation. I just think that um, this needs to be a lot more investigation put into it because it's it's, a, it's actually a a real possibility and it, it is achievable, especially under the Quarrel Falls Dam. I think the Quarrel Falls Dam is the biggest hurdle that people would think it, it may have, but it's, um, there's a report here from Stantec, who is um, Derek Chinney, the well, well respected engineer, and he's put a um, proposal how, how it can be done. And, Operate those 40 steel boats down under the dam. Um, it's a lot of um, a lot of work to be done there, but it's, it can be done. We just think that uh, 
discounting the, the water, water based transport is, is detrimental to the to the rest of, of the community really because traffic is even if they're fast it's still going to be congested how many in the 40 years and um, it's, it's mentally broke and really broken in a while so and even longer term I can see the, the ferry service extending to, to checks points um, Henley's farm and then possibly longer the bigger bigger cattle range to Kingston eventually. Mm. But I think it's got to be put in the plan to to be considered and to be sort of look at the funding. Okay. Yeah. So we understand that it's not included in the public transport business case in the option. Um, and we communicated that we were quite disappointed about that option not being put in there for further investigation. However, it's not in there. Um, but what we were respectfully asking for was consideration to actually the funding of the feasibility study so that we are actually progressing the option rather than just leaving it sitting on the table for some unknown period of time until perhaps the public transport business case is reviewed the next time. So there will come a time where the ferry option is is the only choice or one, you know, a logical next step. And we wanted to make sure that there was these first steps being taken while there was still an opportunity to do it. Oh, thank you, and thank you for the work you've done on this already. Can I just get in my head? Uh, there's three questions, but I'm going to put them all together. The first one is the length of time it takes it would take for the service service to operate, given on your plan attachment P, the routes that you're sort of looking at. Um, the and presumably you can be offering that without doing Bridesdale, and that there is a part service there without doing the work on Quora Falls or not. I'm not quite sure how pivotal that is to your scheme. And also understanding the resilience that this sort of scheme would afford the community in light of, you know, road accidents and things like that. So that one's yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the timing, there's a map in there of the route. Yeah. Um, the uh, timing is about half an hour from Queenstown through to Bridesdale. Oh. Stopping. Stopping twice yep. at Kiln Heights and down there we you probably wouldn't look be, be going taking people down from right uh, Kelvin Heights, but back you would be probably taking a lot of people. But we could do express express runs from Queenstown to if you have a look on that map, that's the um a proposed to you that borders have got there on the corner of um, rem Remarkable's Park. It's called the Willows. Oh, no, no, the no further, the, down. Yeah, further down. Yeah, that's, that's a proposed jetty, mm -hmm. and that would link up to the, to the high school. Mm -hmm. So, and you could go from Lake Hayes, Brysdale, an express run from there to that jetty and drop off school kids, mm -hmm. and vice versa in the afternoon, and vice versa from Queenstown to that jetty. And from that GD to Queenstown too, uh, uh, for school kids, just express runs like that, as well as your, your standard um, trip from Queenstown to, to Bridesdale and Bridesdale back to Queenstown and doing pickups on the way. So you can mix and match on demand, especially for the school school children. Um, what was the other question? Oh, well, it's about your resilience, but it's also, you know, what's stopping you doing this now? Frank and Arm. Yeah. It's, Frank and Arm is just a, a tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. It's really, I, I, I watch that loading every, every day. There's no one to hardly even used. It's just not doing the, the, the bulk or the lion's share of the traffic is from the other side of the bridge. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah, okay. Um, the other the other problem 
that we have is a um, a blanket rule that there's no park and ride. This is what Ken Chuality said put in place. And the the Bridesdale Lake Hayes Park uh, floodplain down there, you can't, it's never going to be built on um, because it's been a floodplain. Uh, they need to have, have a park and ride there. And I know you, it would service um, Bridesdale with uh, shot over the country in Lake Hayes and the new subdivision that's coming up across the road on the Ladies Mile. There's another 2,300 houses going there. I, I think it's, it's critically important that we get a, a water-based ferry service from that point and to, to go right through into town. It's, um, it's, you're not going to be able to get across the bridge. Mm. Andrew? Thanks, uh, Sean and Vanessa. I just wondered, since the election uh, October last year, we had the opportunity to discuss at all with the coalition uh, government with regards to the proposal in any way, shape or form, because they've got a slightly different view on passenger transport than what the previous outfit had. So just wondered if we had a chance to... Talk. Not not with Joseph Moon, you know. Not by um, That's what I'd like to do. But you're not still on the board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, probably wouldn't be here, though. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably sure. Just a couple of things to add. With so we've just heard uh, we were looking for a 40% mode shift in Queenstown, so this would align with that direction. But what um, two things is, what sort of number are you looking at for what dollar value are you looking at for a feasibility study? And also, what numbers have you already done um, to show to you as a business operator or to the community that this is a viable option and not just a, a, a concept. So what have you now been? I, I think in terms of the feasibility study, the view was, and, and we don't know the doors mm. to be honest, but um, was that the opportunity that Ferries provided, not just this route, but all around Jack's Point, Hanley's, et cetera, and potentially to Kingston, there was a, a case for it being done on a wider basis, so as a area basis, not just yeah. a feasibility study of this proposal. It was more about getting the thoughts in place and the dollars and stuff looked at at a high level yeah. for a wider ferry service in the Wapitipi. Right. So, um, and in terms of the numbers, we have um, done some initial work looking at um, running mo the models with the WSP guys, but we didn't progress that further because there's a cost obviously associated with it. And, and when you don't know what's going to happen, you don't want to spend money on something that it could be three, four, five years before you're actually in a discussion about it. So um, it's... It's important that it's looked at as a lake-wide thing, not just specifically. It's about the concept of ferry services in the lake, using okay. the lake. Good. That Thank you. the question. Nothing on line. Uh, that being that, we'll consider that submission. Thanks very much for taking your time. Uh, you. Certainly a great move towards 40% motion. And I won't Thank be you. back. <laughs> <laughs> Today, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 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 Simon Telfer from the Wanaka Buna Community Board. Simon, online, the floor is yours, sir. Good, Okoto. <clears throat> Thanks for hearing me out. So I won't take up too much of your time. Look, our, our submission uh, fully supported uh, what QLDC had, had submitted. So I just uh, hit some of the high notes there. Um, we really feel that there's a need for ORC to start planning for public transport within the Wanaka Upper Clutha area. Um, we'd like that to be in year four of the long-term plan. Uh, as such, you know, the, the community funding 
public transport in the broader region isn't really appealing to us at this time. We'd rather keep our powder dry and be uh, subject to a targeted rate when OIC is putting uh, some really deep and uh, yeah, specific emphasis on public transport in the Wanaka area. Uh, we've trialled it, as you would know, through uh, Community Link and you guys were involved in having to fund that. I just make sure that we leverage that learnings there rather than coming out and just running another trial. I think it's well noted that the Hawea into Wanaka route uh, frequency at peak times is uh, the way to go and then looking out at Luggett as well. Uh, we'd like to also obviously encourage you to consider you know, that technology on demand type public transport as well, uh, which has been trialled elsewhere in the country. Um, look, we're pretty unique here as well, and I just wanted to highlight that our active transport network is is really being fleshed out, and that does si uh, solve sometimes that first mile, last mile, uh, join with the uh, public transport network. So uh, if we could incorporate uh, any sort of planning to, to tie into uh, the shared paths that we have within Wanaka Township itself, that would be really helpful. So that's uh, all I wanted to, to, to say on behalf of the community is that we'd encourage, you know, active tra uh, we'd encourage public transport within Wanaka. We think it should be funded specifically, and that should be in year four. Uh, we're happy for a targeted rate at that stage, but the idea of us sort of subsidising and doing a general uh, rate across uh, the district uh, to be funding sort of uh, Queenstown focused public transport is something that's obviously not appealing, and we'd ask you to reconsider. Happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, that's the uh, uh, that's the prices of our submission. Thank you, Simon. Councillor Kate Walton. Uh, no, thank you, Simon. Um, year four is what we've got in ours to provide that you and you uh, that's what you accept. You don't want to see us providing, as I think Queensland Lake suggested, a bus service earlier. The bus uh, within you, a bus service. That's a reasonably what do you mean by a bus service? Right, so you, you don't want any public transport for the next four years. We're happy to, you've said, to do it in year four, which is what we've got in the long term plan. There have been other suggestions that we need it sooner than that in the uh, one of our area. I think, I, the fun, I, I think we're trying to link the funding, the, 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 the um, rate structure with yes. where we see the delivery. So I think that was where. If there is uh, intention to and a desire to and resources available to speed up the delivery of public transport within the district, obviously we're very, very open to that. But we were linking yeah. the, the need to pay with where it sits in the long-term plan. I, and I was looking at reversing that, that we uh, are just checking whether you think there's a need for it now. If it were deliverable, that's a totally different question, but then breaking when it is available. It's We'd available. obviously encourage, yeah, I mean, you're asking a little bit of a leading question. Obviously, we would encourage that. I think we need to get, uh, what we don't want to do is run another trial and find that yep. we're eliciting the same, soliciting the same information. I think we also just need to be careful too about the, the, the frequency of the hub and spoke model out to the, to, to lug it and to how we are. And it has to be carefully thought through um, because we, we noted when it was at peak times and it was regular, it worked well. When it was stopping all stations and irregular, it wasn't particularly viable. Any further questions? Councillor Noon. Yeah, hey, thanks, Simon. Uh, your comment about the uh, the trials that have been initiated by the community and the count uh, the Queensland Access Council, you know, fair, fair cop, all the rest of it. I think we've got to go through a business case proposal to be able to secure uh, land transport funding or uh, NZTA funding, so to speak, for fifty one percent. So um, we've just got to suck that up, unfortunately. But you know, fantastic to have those trials. But my question is, um, you talk about the first mile, last mile. Scenario. So I think the opportunity for the Upper Clutha area, and that you were hinting to this aspect, is that great to be able to come up with a, a greenfields option that meets the needs, but also takes advantage of the existing active transport 
network and whatever else is planned in that space going forward. Is that what you're hinting at? Absolutely. I think it's got to be joined up. And I know that active transport doesn't fall nicely in the purview of ORC, but it is there and it can provide a solution. So if it's not naturally in your remit, sometimes you forget about that. So I think that's just... Uh, something that is a little more unique to Wanaka than you'll find and maybe in Queenstown and other areas. So I just want that, that to be, be in mind as a, as, a, uh, as a mechanism to help the overall uh, customer journey and not just looking at it, you know, the time they get on the shuttle and the time they get off the shuttle. Thank you. Uh, Simon, we had very good representation in Wanaka uh, from your community board. And look, I'm, my apologies, I've forgotten his name, and was really quite certain that A, we didn't want another trial, uh, but the trial is about us getting funding. So, in light of that, if the, if the trial was uh, structured in such a way that it met as best we could the demands of the community, uh, and at the end of that trial, uh, because one of the words is trial, that it's only going to be temporary and people won't jump on and get going. So, but if we, uh, where would the, yeah, where would be the appetite of the community to then take on either by, by fares and by rates that service if NZTA did not fund it? Uh -huh. Well, that's an open question, isn't it? So, look, I understand what you're saying about the trial and a needs must situation to tick the box or to, to, to meet the business case. Fully understand that. I think we've got to be a little bit careful about trial fatigue within the community. And it's like, because like, we did actually run two trials as part of the community link. We, we ran RAN trial and then we tweaked it and we ran another. Now, we what I don't want to have happen or what we don't want to have happen is another trial that people go, oh, here we go, another trial and it's not supported. So just got to, yeah, death by trial. So... Uh, that's the first thing I just want to point out. When you sort of said the funding, I, you know, I got to be careful. I don't. I, I mean, I'm represented to the community, but we haven't asked specifically this question. But I think that we should be responsible for contributing when uh, ORC believes that there is, you know, a viable service in place. It's basically tied up to service delivery. I'm not sure if that's answering your question. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think when it's tangible, you know, to put on a targeted rate to run another trial, I'm not sure it is going to be appetizing. If it's tr uh, another trial has been done, here's the permanent solution that's coming in. Then as soon as it starts, I think we should be responsible for helping to fund that. Yeah, I, I, look, I'm probably just saying, do you think, because I've got to ask a question. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's actually probably around what we call it and ensuring people understand that we need that service to or that trial to get that fifty one percent, and and that's the that's. I, I think we really need to sell the end goal. I think the first trial was about just uh, soliciting uh, insights and knowledge and evidence and that side of things. I think if we're going to do another trial. It's got to we've got to highlight on what the end goal is and that it's imminent. It's 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 not just a, a an exercise in viability. It is actually to help get that funding. So I think there's a message. I think that's a good point. There's very much a messaging component. And as I said, I, the last thing I want to do is people say, "Oh, here we go, another trial." Roll their eyes. It's only going to be part time. It's only going to be temporary. I'm not going to change my behaviours. I'm not going to change my go to work habits because of that. We have to tie it into something that's going to be a little bit more concrete for us to get the response we need. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Thank you, Simon. Good day. Thanks, team. Thank you. Th thank you, all councillors uh, that are online listening. Thank you to Mr. Saunders for being part of this. And thank you, team, at the table. Thank you to the staff that helped. <laughs> and we will now adjourn and be ready for tomorrow in Dunedin. Uh, we will have to keep a real track of time tomorrow because it will be a full day. And then uh, we'll have to be really quick with our questions and try and rattle these people through, but making sure we listen. Thank you very much. Safe journeys.